All right, so a little bit, a little bit uh, information I do want to give you all before we begin the, the message and tell you more about the week. I always love to kind of give you guys an update with the youth ministry itself, how things are going, where we're at, where we're going, um, and then give you some, some idea of the, the trip, I'll give you some context, as that way when people speak, <coughs> you get a better idea of what they're, what they're talking about. So um, youth ministry is actually going really well this year. We had a really, really fantastic year. Um, I, I believe our youth ministry, at least in the time that I've been doing, I've been doing this since March of 2011, um, since the time I've been doing it, this is the healthiest our youth ministry has ever been. Uh, we are in a really good position. And a couple of reasons why that is, is um, last year, it was a good year, but there was definitely this cultural shift. There was some of the things that we used to do wasn't really working with some of our current kids. Even a game that we played, uh, which is a longtime favorite of ours, um, was not really resonating with kids, and sometimes when you have these games, when you have sixth graders all the way up to high school, uh, seniors in high school, trying to do a game or an activity that gets seven, a seven-year gap to intermix is a little challenging, um, and so when that game itself isn't really generating the kind of cohesiveness that you want, um, you know, some things got to be adapted. I believe that youth ministry, like any ministry in the church, like church itself, is a living organism. It is not made to be static, and if we keep it static, um, we do not adapt and change, and we do not speak to the people of today, and I had that issue in only seven years. Social media was a big change in that, changed a lot with how our kids uh, receive information and how they, and really what's in front of them, and so we went through a revisioning process, and that process unveiled a few things. One, we had to create an environment, a space that was welcoming. Uh, we redid our entire space. We updated it with uh, some technology and just created a, a different environment. They say if you want to change the heart, change the environment. So that's what you do to try to open up the heart. Um, and you also want to make sure that you have an environment that is welcoming for everybody. And that also um, allows kids a space to be able to ask and talk about really tough things in their life um, or to bring really hard faith questions. It is my job as their minister not to tell them how to believe, but help to be a guide for them. And so we wanted to kind of adapt what we do to, to, to do that for the ministry. Um, and, you know, when I started in 2011, it was basically Sunday morning. And then slowly we were adding, you know, one, two Sundays a month. And now we're full-fledged, full-on, uh, every Sunday, unless the Greater Clark has a, has a holiday or, or a vacation, um, and it's Wednesdays too. So now we're a multi-event during the week, retreats, mission trips, all sorts of stuff that goes on. This thing has definitely grown like a living organism from a little, little seed to a pretty big tree now. Um, and, and, and part of that is just seeing how these kids, uh, one, um, have this, have created this environment that is, I believe, is a pretty welcoming place for anybody who wants to come, um, but also how well they get along with each other. And most importantly, we wanted to put a place together that would allow them to deepen that relationship or begin that relationship with Jesus, right? That's the, the main important thing. Um, we've always had a history of having kids come to our youth ministry that were coming in in high school, which is really rare. A lot of kids leave when they drive. We were actually getting more kids coming through a children's ministry. Well, that's flipped. Um, we still get kids later on in, in life, but we also have this really great children's ministry now that you're seeing more and more kids come up and grow up in um, that kids are coming with a, a little more of a foundation. So we had to kind of adapt some of that. Um, so youth ministry should be good for a while. You know, I always, you know, numbers tell a part of the story, but they don't tell the whole story. But just number-wise, um, we're almost hitting 40 right now. A couple years back, we were in the 50s. We're at 52. So, you know, and I've said this stat before. A good youth ministry is 5% of your worshiping congregation. There's probably 150, 160 people here. So you're talking a good ministry, seven, eight kids. A thriving ministry, 15. And we're hitting high 30s. Like, I could lose more than half and still be considered a thriving ministry. So it tells a part of the story. doesn't tell the whole story. So the involvement that these kids have, the way they invite people, the way um, that, that the youth group and church means to them, and, and the fact they want others to join in means a lot. And I really want to lift up those that have come before us because um, this has been a process to get to this point. And there's youth, uh, youth, youth alumni here that are, you know, here like Bradley and Carly and Brandon Harden works in the back now. Patrick Allen's here who's, who was in my first year. And I'm definitely, 
a different youth minister than Patrick's first year. Um, uh, I have hopefully grown a little bit, um, but if it wasn't for those groups that came before us and those kids that helped lay that foundation, we would not be where we are today. So I am internally grateful for the work that they put in because we're only where we're at today because of what they've done. We just continue to build upon it in every group that graduates. And we have a really special group of four seniors. Um, always leave something really special behind and something that we can continue to grow on. So we're really, um, I'm really excited about where the, where the ministry's going. Um, so that's a little bit about youth ministry. So the trip itself. Uh, we go through a company called Next Step Ministries. Uh, we've been going through them. This was our sixth trip through them. I literally cannot fathom using any other group right now uh, for, for mission trips. I get asked a lot. I get hit up with a lot of calls and emails about check this mission trip group out or this mission trip group out, and it's well and good, but Next Step, we absolutely love them. Uh, we've done uh, six trips now. They're all uniquely different. Um, they're all challenging. They're well prepared. We love the staff. In fact, we have one of the staffs from uh, staff members from South Dakota here with us today. She actually is in New Albany. You can raise your hand, Ashley. So she, she was excited for us to show up all summer because she's been working out there and she gets somebody who is fairly local. And um, uh, it's cool to kind of see and bump into people who work with Next Step that are local. I, I was down at River Stage one time at a Next Step staff person saw one of my Next Step shirts and was like, hey, did you do a mission trip? I'm like, yeah. And they happened to be uh, an employee of Next Step. And uh, we know Garen Moore. He is serving out in Colorado this summer as the MC. Um, I know Jake and Kelly Pageant have both expressed interest in being Next Step people, and they are really hoping um, that they get to enter next year. One of them at least hopes that they can do it in Oklahoma, which is where we're going to go next year. Um, because, as Jake said, he just wants to be my boss for a week. So, um, and I, I figure I, I worship a God who is so powerful <laughs> that parts the seas and can do amazing things. And I'm actually praying deeply and strongly. And I want you to join me in that prayer that this happens. Because I have seven years of payback built up <laughs> that I can just unload in a week. You know how many questions I got from you all? Oh, Man, I can't wait. So I'm really hoping, but I'm excited in the summer in serving and continue in that way. I have to, I can't fathom, I can't wait to hear from Garen and his experience. Um, and I know uh, we've kind of taken a page out of the camp uh, handbook. You know, we see these long, um, long sustainable relationships. These uh, young adults have, you know, 20 plus years, 30 plus years of camp relationships, going to weddings as they're older. You know, that's what we want to have in youth ministry. And I think um, to help us develop the relationship, getting away for nine days like that um, helps those relationships form. Because things happen in nine days. Uh, things get unveiled that don't get to happen on two hours on a Sunday. It's one reason why we like to go far away. Because I get that question every year. Why go far away? Because I know uh, a local church, you know, they, had, they hosted a, a local mission trip group. And that's great. Hey, fantastic. There is work to do in Jeff. Fantastic. I, I, we took food to them. Many of you did. That's great. I want to support that. Love that. Love the fact they did that. If that's their calling, wonderful. It's not our goal. My goal, I want to get them out and uncomfortable. That is my, one of my goals. Why? Because it creates space for God. Right? When you get, when you have a tough moment and you're uncomfortable and you're hurting a little bit, sometimes you have to either rely on the person next to you or God or both. Um, and so I want that uncomfortableness. You know, I don't give a lot of details to what's going to happen. And for some people who like to know details, especially my adult chaperones, um, they like to know what's happening next and going on, I don't tell you much of anything, right? In fact, this year, well, one of the big things, there's always a twist. And this year, one of the twists was, you know, we usually shower in a shower trailer. So just picture a trailer with seven stalls in it, and that's what you shower in. Texas, it was about 120 degrees because in Texas it felt like it was 180 outside and it just, just there was no vent and you just, you just, a sauna in there. It was, you were sweat the whole week, even when you got your shower. Um, so you cramped up and you try to make the best of it. But the good news was, and I told him, I said, good news, not only do we have a shower trailer this week, we have a bathroom trailer. And so the bathrooms were in a trailer. And I didn't know what that meant. Like, for all I knew, that could have been like, there's a hole in the ground and good luck. You know, like, you know, I... It, I had no idea. Um, the, the faces on certain individuals are like, oh boy. You know, but I want that uncomfortableness. Um, it allows us to grow as people. 
Um, and, and they do a really good job of kind of rolling with those punches and rolling with what's coming. Because as I preached at camp here recently, um, what, and I say this all the time, the only thing that you actually have in life is the moment you're in. That's it. It's the only gift you have. How do, I learned this through, through dealing with cancer. There is no future. That's an illusion. The only thing you have is the present. That's it. Not the past, not the future. It's right now. The breath you take is what you get. That is your gift. What do you do with it? What do you do with that breath? And so we strip away the phones. We strip away everything because I only want them focused on the present moment. And they do such a fantastic job with this. But it's been cultivated over years with the kids um, really choosing to do this. So I'm really proud of them for how they encounter this this time. Um, and when we chose South Dakota, we knew it was going to be a little different being on a reservation. Um, it is quite a sad, sad um, environment. It is really, really sad to see what has happened to people on reservations. Um, it, it is poverty beyond uh, that I, I have ever seen. Um, so much so, in fact, I know the lady's house that we were working on um, didn't even have a bathroom. And so, uh, you know, when we were like, well, we got to go in a bathroom trailer. So what? You know, like you want to talk about immer more immersive type mission work. That's kind of what this is. So we knew, we knew South Dakota, but we did Colorado the previous year. So I, I was not going to kill my chaperones with 16-hour road trips back-to-back -back years. So I usually draw a circle. And I tell the kids, just pick where you want to go. So last year they picked Ohio, and I promised this year we'd go South Dakota. Um, and, and they were thrilled with it. And then next year we chose to go back to Oklahoma. Um, and I usually give my seniors a choice. And next year my seniors are Jenna and Elena. Um, and so they kind of had the choice. Elena wanted to go back. She served in Oklahoma her very first year doing mission work, and she wanted to go back and, and, and see that area. So we're excited to, to be able to do that and go and serve back into that community. And in fact, I've, I have maintained a relationship with one of the Next Step staff people um, this entire time. Uh, she's actually made a lot of pictures that hang up in our youth room, um, and she was the first person I reached out to when they decided, saying, hey, we're coming back to Oklahoma. And she was so excited to, to have us back because she asked me every year if I'm going to return. Um, and so she really loved our kids and really loved our group. Um, that really speaks a lot about that group from that time and, and really who we are. So we're excited to do that. We also know it's not possible without you all, without you all supporting us the way you do financially. Just beyond, uh, one of the, uh, there was two churches there, multi-campus churches. Um, that served with us, and they were curious on how we did it at the cost that we do it at. You know, I charged 550, which is pretty ex pretty expensive still for a mission trip. But they were up in the 700s charging their kids. If I charge too much, kids some kids can't go, um, and so we want to keep costs down. The extra cost beyond like it costs. I had to send a check in 420 dollars a person to to pay next step. I mean, that leaves us 130 dollars per person to use for whatever we need to get out there. Um, if you do the math on 35 people, that's somewhere around, what, 4500 bucks. It's about 10000 extra dollars we need to be able to do a mission trip every year. That means for these trips to even be done, I need five to $6,000 from the church in giving every year to do that. And I don't know if I've ever given that number before, but every year it happens, and I always tell the kids I work in faith. Why? Because I believe in the church. Because I know it means a lot to you all to see these kids do this, and so we're very appreciative of the extra money that you give us and the giving and the generosity you give us because it could not happen without you all. So we are very thankful. With that being said, I want to call up some people. That's enough of me talking. I want to have them share some of their experiences. They don't even know who's first yet. Gavin. Get on up here, buddy. Gavin will be first. So Gavin has been on my youth council this last year. Um, going to be a junior at Jeff, correct, Gavin? Um, great leader, great, great individual, one of the hardest workers you'll ever find on site, wonderful with other people. So he was somebody we definitely wanted to hear from. Gavin, take it away. Hi, I'm Gavin. Um, <laughs> this year one was really special for me. I got to hang out with uh, my three greatest friends. I got, uh, or two, I got um, MJ and Michael Vaughn. He's not here today, uh, but he's really cool. Um, we got to be in our group together. We were in a group last year. Uh, it's always fun being with them because I don't get to see Michael Vaughn every day because he doesn't go to our school, but MJ does, so I get to see him every day. Uh, but this year, um, it was a little different. We went to this, uh, so our work site, um, we were, you know, we always get loaded up for the day. Everyone's like getting ready to get their tools in the, in the, in the carts and stuff, in the cars. 
So we get in our cars and we start driving and we start driving and we're like, all right, are we gonna get there? It's, it's been like a 30 minutes and then it's been 45 minutes, it's almost been an hour and we're like driving still. And then we pull up and there's nothing there, there's nothing. There's just a little tiny house and we're like, this is what, there's a little tiny house, we gotta work on this house. So we get inside and there's, there's no perspective because like we, we live in these houses, these huge houses. And I mean, this house is like a quarter, not even that, it's like an eighth of this room. It's, it's so tiny, you know, like they're talking 12 people have to live in these houses. Um, so all this week, we've been, wor we were working on shingles. So we were shingling, we had uh, David and Joe working in our group. Um, David knows a lot about shingles. Um, <laughs> so we, we were doing shingles, so we had to lay them and we were learning how to do it and all. But um, this whole week, um, we didn't get to um, meet our homeowner. And I think that's something very special that um, we didn't get this year. So instead of um, building relationships with our homeowner, we, we build relationships with each other, the, the few of us that were in our group. It was really special because I think we all grew closer with each other and then with God. Um, I think that's, that's something we don't get to do every year because usually we're more devoted to our homeowner. But this year we were kind of building together and that was really special for me. Awesome, awesome. Um, what, what is it about these mission trips that you, you come back every year. I mean, sometimes, you know, you have to give up, you have, I don't know if you have to give up band this year or not, I'm, I don't know, but I know sometimes you have to carve out some time. You're busy, Boy Scouts, band, other things. What, what makes these special that you choose it every year? Um, I think the people, this is my family. This is my extended family. I love these people. Um, they really do make my whole world. They make everything better when I'm here. I feel safe. It's a, it's a, it's a different layer of home. Awesome. Awesome. Amen. All right. Thank you, Gavin. I think that is one of the things that we kind of see when we were at the reservation. I mean, I know when we left heading home, we, I, I counted, we drove an hour and a half, almost two hours before we saw another car on the road. I mean, it's crazy, the vastness of these places. And it's beautiful land. I can see why they don't want anybody to come in that lane and do anything with it. Um, totally back them up on that. It is gorgeous, gorgeous land. And um, yeah, it, it is, but you are in, like, you see people walking down the road, you're like, where are you going? Like, I don't even know what's even near you. You know, like, it's, but it's, they've, they've figured out a way to, to adapt to it. it um, but it is something out there. I want to bring up Amy Harper. I know she's over here. Oh, let's get it, Amy. Let's get it. Amy, first time chaperone. And she survived. She actually did really well. Um, yeah, give her Amy a round of applause on this. My, my only concern for Amy going on the trip was she's notoriously known for going to bed early, right? Yes. And we lost an hour going there. So when you go to bed at 11, it's really midnight. And when you're used to bed at yeah, 9. I struggled. Woo. I did. Yeah. Um, the mission trip was awesome, um, long in the car. We were in the car for two straight days. Joe Paris and I were the, the lead vehicle and we got to navigate and uh, everybody followed us. Mm -hmm. So um, I, there's so much that um, I wanna say about the mission trip. So, so many really awesome things happened. So many exhausting things <laughs> happened. Um, I'm not a young parent, and uh, I did struggle with just the physically challenging parts of the trip. Um, thank goodness um, Jim Dooley and, and, and Chad and some of the other chaperones are fellow coffee drinkers. The first morning we got up and I really needed coffee, really badly, and the pots were broken. And these young people, it'll be a bit, and I kept watching the pot, and there was no coffee. And Jim was on our a crew with me, and I said, Jim, we have got to get a coffee pot. I don't care where we go. And there was luckily a family dollar right across the state line on our way to our site, so we stopped there every day and bought the last coffee pot. And uh, the trip got a lot better after. Yeah. <laughs> after that because yeah. I had my coffee. Um, so the site that um, we worked on, that I worked on with um, Aiden and Charlie, who else was in our group? Alex. Alex, yes. 
and Paris girls. And the Paris girls, and Caroline. yes. Yes. They're from okay. Caroline. Yep. And Jim and I, Zach. So we, um, the ladies' house we went to, her name was June Two Bulls, um, and her husband Frank, and they lived in a trailer that was, I'm guessing, maybe 30, 40 years old. Um, they had no indoor plumbing. Um, they had no electricity for a few days, um, but that got fixed. But anyway, we were um, replacing some siding and some shingles on, and just uh, aluminum siding on her house. Um, and she was there, very nice lady. She was my age. Um, and her grandson was there that day as well, and her, and her husband. So we started work, and I was talking to her, and she um, made makes jewelry for a living. I'm wearing her bracelets. And she told me that um, she has lived there on the reservation, on and off, all of her life. Um, but that she, um, it's her home. And I, I didn't, you know, we got there and it was really sad. It was not, it was not a nice place to live. It was not fit for human habitation, in my opinion. And of course, I wasn't going to say, why do you live here? Because this was her home, and what right did I have to say that to her? So I just tried to talk to her and get as much about her story and her life as I could. And um, I looked at her jewelry, and she was very proud of the work she did. Um, and she, her grandson was there, Todd. He was about six years old. And um, this child was, um, um, how do I say it? He was... Um, and very, very in need of like physical attention. Like um, he would throw himself on the kids and they would play with him. And that, I've not seen a child that way before in my life. Um, and, and it kind of freaked me out at the beginning, I'll be honest about that. But as I saw the kids engage with Todd and um, every time they were around him, they stopped what they were doing and just played with this little boy and, and loved on him. It was so obvious he was starving for love and attention. And, and my son, Riley, um, was not raised that way, obviously, and neither were hardly any of the kids in this church, probably any. And it was just hard to, to watch um, because he was so needy. But the smile on his face when these kids played with him um, filled my heart and um, the last day we stopped on our way to the site to the family dollar because that was our hangout and we stopped there every morning and um, bought him just some little gifts you know something you'd buy at the dollar store or whatever and um, his little face I'm sure lit up he wasn't there and just to see that God connection with this smile from this little boy was uh, really touching um, there were a lot of moments like that that were really touching for me. The, the big one, another big one, was the foot washing ceremony that we did on, I can't remember what night. It was late, and I was so tired. But <laughs> yeah. I was like, foot Thursday. washing, yeah. are you kidding? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so you were like six, seven days in by that time. Yeah, that was uh, I was, yeah. So the foot washing was great. <laughs> if, if nobody knows what that is, um, I got the privilege of, washing Riley's feet, and he washed my feet, and we prayed for each other, and everybody prayed for each other, and it was absolutely beautiful, um, and it showed me that um, these kids really love each other. They really love each other. They nurture each other. They pray for each other. Um, you know, they also mess around and act like teenagers and middle schoolers, and, and uh, but to see the love that I felt at that moment was just really, really humbling and inspiring. And, um, you know, you hear a lot of adults today. I hear a lot of adults today, you know, say kids these days, huh? You know, and let me tell you, we are in fabulous hands with this group right here. And these leaders, Chad and Stephanie and Kelly and Michael and Jim and wherever the other chaperones are, I'm drawing a David blank. David and Joe. David and Joe, yeah. Um, we, it was just really a great experience with them. Um, they love these kids. They take time out of their schedules to spend a week with them. And you can tell that the kids appreciate it. And uh, I'm really grateful that I got the 
I'm still recovering. Um, I'm still sleepy, and I'm still um, on a high from it. Um, it was um, it was a lot of things, and I guess to sum it up, it was pretty awesome. So thanks for talking me into it. Yeah. I guess. I we're guess we're going to Oklahoma next year. <laughs> yeah, you got it. You got it. Thank you. Yeah, mission trips tough on chaperones, and, and I always I jokingly say this in the beginning. I don't care about my chaperones' comfort, um, and and yeah, that's always really positive. Like first me, thanks for serving. I don't care about your comfort, uh, but there is some truth to that. Um, it's about these kids, and I need selfless leaders, and and that's who they are. They are willing to step up, and you know, on that foot washing thing, we you know, to, not to get to the pers too personal stuff, but. You know, we, we, Thursday was a tough day for us uh, there. Uh, I don't know what happened. Thursday was just a tough day. And, uh, yeah, kids, kids, we were a little, a little, little something. And uh, we, had, we had two kids in particular that, that had an had a issue. And I was so tempted in this foot washing ceremony to make them wash each other's feet and pray for them, right? Because you want to get over an issue with each other? You want to get into a fight with somebody? You want to pr go pray? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to force you to get at their feet and pray for them. I thought, no, I won't do that. Let's see what happens. So when the kid comes up during the ceremony and says, can I pray for this individual? Yes. Yes. We do that children's blessing, and I don't think we think about it enough when we say, come back and teach us about the kingdom of God as only children can do. How many of you right now are struggling with another individual that you can't even bring yourself to forgive or pray for? And a child did that, did that. Not long after, you see him arm in arm, things are okay. We don't, you want to know where your mission field is? It's right here. It's right here. Well, yeah, we can go away for a week, and that's well and good, but you want to know where your mission field is? The church is right here with each other. Sometimes that's your mission field. It's the person sitting next to you that needs you, or it's the way your church or community needs you to serve. And so sometimes we get, uh, we just wait till 51 weeks until the next year, but um, I think Thursday, as, as tough of a day as that was for us, it was such a, a movement forward for us too, and God worked in that moment. There was nothing I did, nothing I could do to make anything better. God absolutely moved uh, with those kids, and I, I could not be prouder for how we came through that moment, so um, amen to that, so I want to bring my seniors up. Come on up. Yeah, you're, yeah, you're graduated senior. I guess you're a freshman now. I don't know your college. Uh, we're missing Kelly. He's on vacation today. Um, so we definitely miss having Paget here on, on his voice. So, um, but I wanted to give the seniors a chance to share a lot about um, whatever, whatever was really on their heart. These four seniors have been just so involved all four years. But they're also a rare breed. What are all four of you going to college for? Engineering. Oh, is that on? No, speak loud. Engineering. Uh, yeah, engineering. All four going to engineering. All four came in together. All four graduated together. I didn't add one. I didn't subtract one. I mean, they are the most, like, nothing changed. Like, they are so consistent, and they are, like, here every week. And I can, everything today in the service, I prepared nothing. They did. Everything they say, they did it. Uh, it's really amazing um, because I've been gone forever, it feels like. And so everything was like, hey, will you do a prayer, Jake? Sure. And that was it. I didn't have to, I don't write it. And so the fact that you see how they've grown as people, who they are today as individuals, but where they're in their faith, I mean, I know I'm extremely proud. I hope you all are too when you look, look at them and, and hear from them. So, Colby, we'll just start with you. So, uh, We've been in youth for seven years now, and thinking about it, we're 18, so we've spent over a third of our lives in this youth group, and looking back and seeing how much they've grown and how much I've grown over these seven years, I think we can attribute a lot of that to our youth experience, and uh, we just grow a lot over the years, and the pinnacle of that growth comes on these mission trips. When you're uncomfortable, like Chad said, and um, to be on these mission trips is, I think I can speak for everyone else, I think we're just really lucky. And to have been on six myself, you see the other groups, the other seniors and youth groups that you see on these mission trips, and they've been on two. 
and we've had experiences to be on six and seven of them. And I think we're just really lucky to have been able to be a part of that. And I just want to thank the congregation for making that happen and thank Chad and Steph for making that happen. And above all, thank the parents for allowing that to happen. All right, hi guys. Um, <laughs> so for me, mission trip has really just been like, kind of just like the, it's kind of like the end of the youth year, but at the same time, it was kind of like the beginning, obviously, except this year, because as Chad keeps pointing out, this is my last everything. It, we made it a point at every time it was my last doing something. Like, literally, we were five minutes into the trip, and we got it to the first gas, gas station, and he said, Kate, this is your last first gas station a mission trip. So, you know, uh, and that kind of just atones to two that I've just loved these mission trips, and I've loved this youth group, um, this perspective. I've, I kind of saw myself as I got older, I got more active in youth too. Um, but I also had things, you know, conflicting on Sundays. I always did, like, you know, most other people, you got stuff to do. I had Girl Scouts for a really long time on Sundays. And, you know, I enjoyed Girl Scouts and I love those girls too, but I also grew to love this youth group and these ladies and gentlemen sitting over there are really like family. So getting to spend a whole week with a lot of these people was really special. Uh, you know, I started out Emily made me this bracelet, like, where I got that on, like, the second day. I still haven't taken it off. Um, I love it. But it just, you know, that's like, kind of like our family. We do stuff for each other. We love each other. We spend a lot of time together. And it's just been a wonderful time here in youth. Okay, so for me, youth group and mission trips specifically have been a really big part of my life for seven years now. So I went to a different school than all of them, so without this youth group, I really never would have uh, I knew them from elementary school and but I probably wouldn't have kept in touch with them I would have never met I don't think anyone over there without youth <laughs> so uh, it's just been a big part of my life because this is a group that I know that I can trust with anything and it's a group that I've grown really close with and really just everyone in the group you can it's easy to talk to and interact with like on our work site this year, we were up roofing, and it was me, Colby Kelly, and then we had Gavin Husson and Riley Harper in our group also. And so it's just kind of unique having those kind of younger people there with us, and we were able, like, just seeing them be able to get up on the roof and do some work and make a good effort, like, that's really just really cool to see. And just because that's kind of what we were five or six years ago, and it's this is this youth group is really unique because we're able to all combine with middle and high school with about 35 kids which is kind of a perfect storm i'd say for our youth group because it's kind of chaotic with such a large age gap but it's really cool just because you can see those you can have those interactions with people that are in sixth and seventh grade when i would never be having those interactions without this youth group so it's just been a really big part of my life because of the relationships that i've been allowed to develop through it. Yeah, awesome. Now, one thing I, I want to ask you all, and maybe you can, because there's probably parents out there with young kids, and you all are excellent students. Um, and really, I shouldn't even say excellent. I mean, you guys are phenomenal. You guys are top-end students. You do sports. You're in clubs. You're in activities. You have all this, everything. You have so many other things to choose from, yet you have always made time for your faith, uh, even if you don't get a chance to come to youth, you'll sit in service on that Sunday. How is it, how do you all balance that? How is it that you have carved out time when in this world, the number one excuse for not doing something is, I don't have time. You all have made it. How? How, 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 is, it, how is it you guys have done that? Well, for me, like on Sunday evenings, I would always make sure that I went to church. I would usually just do my homework sometime after and I would get to it eventually, but I would always come to this first because that's kind of, I really enjoyed coming to youth and that was something that I kind of centered my Sunday around, just church and then youth later in the day and worried about the rest later. For me at first, especially like sixth and seventh grade, I did it poorly. Um, you know, I had Girl Scouts about the exact same time that I had youth and it was in Charlestown. 
um, or at River Valley, I think, in sixth and seventh grade. So, you know, I, I didn't really balance that. I went to one or the other, and that was, I did Girl Scouts like twice a month, I think. So, you know, I'd come to like one or two a month. Um, but as time went on, um, I can get to youth. And so I eventually did that, um, especially when I got up into high school. So I started to come to more Sundays. And I think that was partially crucial, too, for me to get to like really get to know people, too. Because, you know, you see people in church, and we can sit over there. But, you know, you're talking like in between songs and whatnot. So, you know, how much do you really get to know a person in, you know, five minutes between songs and whatnot? So getting to really come to every Sunday and talk with everybody there, it really helped me to get to know the people um, below me and above me both. So um, as I made more time um, for youth and then through hangout this year on Wednesdays, because for a lot of the girls at Jeff, I know we have Anchor Club and there's a whole bunch of other clubs that go on on Wednesdays. Um, but honestly, like it literally just became my favorite thing this year. And I was like, I'll go to Anchor Club. And as soon as it's out, I was out the door and here at youth. Um, I was often here if I didn't have anything going on. Uh, I was always here first. Like I got in my car and I drove. Uh, so and I really enjoyed it. So this has been a lot of fun. Uh, it's really easy to get caught into a really busy schedule, but if you think about it, you'll never regret taking the time out of your Sunday to come to youth because it's always such a refreshing part of your life, especially when you're stressed out from all the things that you have to do, especially as you get older, the more responsibilities you have, and uh, it's just always it's a really nice break, and these people are really great, so it's always good to connect with people and just take time out of your week. Yeah, awesome. Thank you guys, thank you. So the majority of our work um, that we did this year was, was really a lot of roofing. We did a ton of roofing, ton of uh, outside stuff on houses. I know they suffered some hail damage from some storms and I think that may have been one of the reasons why. Um, another thing that we kind of noticed when we were doing our travels was Iowa. If you have not kept up on the devastation of the farmers in Iowa, holy cow, it is heartbreaking. That land has been changed. There are farmers, their lives are over. They will never, never recover from that. It is devastating to see. And so that right away was kind of preparing my heart for like, whoa, You're like, oh my gosh. And I don't even know like what I can do about that. But I think it was eye-opening to all of us because it literally looked like you were driven by big ponds and small lakes. And no, it was just rainwater that flooded. Um, and I know Pine Ridge, where we served, dealt with the same thing and knocked out a lot of their water. Um, it's just, so you just see some situations that you just would never see here um, at all. And, and somebody in the, we heard, heard a speaker talk about, people asked, why don't you leave the reservation? She, they said, there's an invisible fence around the reservation. They can't leave. They can't get out. So we just think, well, just leave. Go get a job. Go get food. Go. Why don't you just leave? Well, they're not educated. They, they, they can't. They, they literally feel like prisoners inside that reservation. Where are they going to go? They don't have cars. And so, you know, I don't know how we fix that. But it's all, to me, it, it, we have to be empathetic to people. And, and one thing I always try to challenge people, because I hear it a uh, hundred times before we do mission trips, a hundred times after. Well, it's great for kids to do this because th then they really appreciate what they have. And I will destroy that every time. This is not about us going home and being thankful we have a shower or a toilet to sit on. We don't ever use somebody's bad circumstance to make us feel better about ours. It's about recognizing the fact that we are blessed in certain ways. Either those ways be physical, we can physically do the work, we can financially provide, or maybe we have the knowledge, if we have the, the, the blessing of, of our lives, how do we share that with people? How do I give up and actually sacrifice something that I can sacrifice to better somebody else's life? Regardless of asking if they're worthy of it. It's not about asking whether somebody deserves or worthy of it. Jesus never tells us to do that. It's about going and seeing people for where they are and who they are and what is happening and what can I do right now. So what do we do? I see our adult chaperones get together and buy a basketball hoop for a girl that loves to play basketball. The girl did not give us a big thank you afterwards. It is, it is uh, they don't get a lot of gifts. And so for us, when we give a gift and we don't get that big thank you and hug and gosh, we appreciate it so much, we can say, oh, well, why, why give it? Oh, shoot, why give it? They didn't appreciate it. We brought them food, they didn't appreciate it. 
because you have no idea what that gift is going to do. You have no idea what that gift and how that's going to change somebody's life. We're not giving gift to get something back. We're giving it freely, sacrificially, hoping that it does something for them. So they get to practice that. They get to see people who come up, and we were told, do not give them money. Uh, buy something from them. They're prideful people. They make a lot of jewelry. If you get a chance, buy something from them. That brings them dignity. And so you, you think about ways in which to bring people dignity, those that are struggling. How do we bring them dignity rather than just doing mindless charity? Let me just give you money and then. How do I actually bring you dignity? How do I actually help your life out? How do I actually uh, make you feel better about where you are, who you are, and how do I help you take that next step? And so doing these trips helps us with so much of this when we get to go out and experience different places in this country. And I think as we get to sit on it, I'm with Amy, I, I finally slept the other night. Like, I have not slept. Finally. I had to take two five milligram melatonins, but it worked. Uh, but I finally slept. I mean, you do, you recover. I mean, it is, it is, you are trying to process everything that you've seen and gone through. Uh, but these trips are so special. Did you ever think, Harper's, you'd ever see Riley Roof? No. no. He may not have roof, right. Which is why I don't put parents with kids, um, uh, but Gavin Hudson on a roof. Seeing Kate Stinson, seventh grade year, not be able to use a power screwdriver. I could not get her to use a power screwdriver to save her life. She held the board for me while I screwed something in. And now, yes, she'll do that. She'll hop on roofs. She'll do siding. She'll dig holes. She doesn't, I mean, what she's learned, just some basic skills, is really valuable. Um, but just to see them grow as people, man, I'm telling you, they're growing each and every year. So we thank you so much um, for the ways that you do this. Thank you so much for your prayers and thoughts during that time. And uh, uh, hopefully, hopefully we've glorified God in the work that we do.